They say when the going gets tough, the tough get going. But how do you get going when you don't feel very tough? What do you do when you feel rather weak? We have to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. How can we persevere in these crazy times, stressful, anxious, worrisome times, times laden with fear? You keep your eyes on Jesus. And one way we keep our eyes on Jesus is to keep our ears open to his word. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, he's quoting Psalm 95. If is a big word. It's a little word, but it's a very important word because it's a word of covenant. It's a conditional word. We don't have to be worried about God's part in the covenant. God loves you with an unconditional love. God's grace is unconditional. You never have to worry about God. He will be your God. That's the covenant. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. We don't have to worry about God. But the question is, will we be his people? We will be his people if we hear his voice. Hearing and listening are very important in both Uh, The Old and New Testament in the Jewish culture and the Jewish language, hearing is important. The Shema in Deuteronomy 6 was the prayer that Jews would pray every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word here is Shema. It's very important. And here in Hebrews chapter 3, he's writing to some early Christians who were discouraged. They're in worrisome times themselves. They're fearful. Their persecution's ramping up. What's going to happen? They don't know what the future looks like. And so he points back to the wilderness generation in the Exodus, the Exodus generation. They came out of the came out of Egypt by great displays of God's power. God showed them his power by crossing the Red Sea and by destroying Pharaoh's army. But they still tested God with grumbling and mumbling and unbelief. They didn't trust God. And so the result was that God gave them up to die in the wilderness and swore that they would not enter his rest. They didn't trust God. They let they had evil, unbelieving hearts, as it says here. And for Christians, this is a powerful picture. For them, it was a powerful picture. Because this we, they and us have been, they and we have been treated with great mercy Great shows of power, the resurrection of Jesus, the sending of the Spirit, God's Word given to us. We have a lot of lot in common with the situation of the Exodus generation. We also have the tendency to grumble and to murmur and complain like they did. And so we but we have to persevere. When the going gets tough, we get going by listening, by stopping and listening. And Hebrews 3 is saying, Don't be like Israel. Listen to God's word. Hear his voice. That's how we persevere. I want to read the first few verse, this quotation from Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So how do you persevere though? How do you, what does it mean to listen to his voice? What does this entail? I have three words for you today that come from Hebrews 3 verses 12 through 19. The first word is watch. Watch. Verse 12. Take care. In in Greek, it's just, let's look, watch, you know, be on the lookout. Watch, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So the first idea is watch out. The devil knows what's in, he knows how to strike us. He knows that there are distractions in our, in our hearts, in our eyes all the time. And so the devil knows how to lure us away. He's a roaring lion, always going about seeking who he may devour. And so God wants us to be aware of that. And it's difficult, though, because when you think about your five senses, they're all taking things in from the outside, aren't they? You see and hear all of them are taking in from external sources. It's almost counterintuitive to look inside yourself. 
We're so prone to guard ourselves from others that we may neglect what's going on inside ourselves. But he's saying here, watch, you've got to examine your heart. Look inside yourself. And the specific thing we're looking for is an evil, unbelieving heart. Like today, the ancients thought that the heart was the center of who you are, the center of your emotions and your will and the core of your personality. An unbelieving heart is an untrusting heart. So what does that mean for them and us to have an unbelieving heart? It meant for the wilderness generation, they don't trust God. They didn't trust that God's going to lead them into the promised land. They get, they're going through this time of difficulty. They're in the wilderness and it's tough and it's hard. And they just, they complain that it, God isn't going to take care of us. This isn't nothing, nothing good will come of this. They complain and they, they don't make it out. For this generation, they're in a time of persecution. Some are falling away. Some are leaving. Some are not liking uh, the, the situation they're in and they're giving up. In our situation, it's a fearful time. It's worrisome. There's lots of social anxiety. And we may not think about it in these terms of giving up on our faith, of course, but we've got to watch our hearts because no one ever just says, you know what, I'm done with this Christianity business. That's not how it works. Instead, Satan gets inside your heart and creates distrust in you, creates distrust mainly of God. And that's how it looks for us. It sounds a lot like fear, doesn't it? It's just a God's description of the land then was true, but they, they took their eyes off the Lord. They were fearful. So I know that this is hard for me to say. I, I struggle with this too, because it's just that there's so much anxiety. It's, it's, it's so hard to fight it off right now. Even I'm kind of a Hakuna Matata kind of guy. I'm calm and easygoing, but all it's wearing on all of us. I know it's wearing on all of us. So there's a line between worry and unbelief. There's a line between anxiety and lack of trust. And we, it's up to us to examine ourselves. Is my anxiety I'm feeling now approaching that line where I'm not trusting God? Only we can determine that. So be careful and watch. So it can, because as he says, if we don't take care and watch for an evil, unbelieving heart, it can lead us to fall away from the living God in verse 12. It can lead us away. An evil, an evil unbelieving heart can lead us away from the living God because it, it takes us away from the God who is life. We may think that the power is in ourselves, that we are able in and of ourselves to do this, but we're not. In Numbers chapter 13, Caleb said, God will lead us through this. We can, we can do this. We can go face them. And everyone else said, no, we can't face it. We can't. And then God says, okay, well, without me, you're not going to. And then everybody said, all right, well, I guess let's go do this. And without God, they went to battle. And without God, they lost. They weren't thinking about the living God. God is our strength. The church's only strength now is the church's only strength then. My only strength now is my only strength ever, and it is the living God who is able to save. What's going to get you through this pandemic? What's going to get you through the worry of life in general, the social unrest, all this, all that this crazy year has brought us? The thing that will get us through is the living God. So watch. Watch your heart. Stop looking at everybody else. Don't look at everybody else and see what they're saying and doing. Turn inward and look at your heart and see how are you doing with God? Are you listening to God? Today, if you hear his voice. Okay, first word, watch. Second word, exhort. This is from verse 13. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So exhort means to encourage. Encourage. You notice he didn't say rebuke one another, did he? Didn't say name calling. Didn't say it being hypercritical. There's a time to rebuke, of course. But it's not when someone is in affliction. You don't rebuke when someone's in affliction. You admonish the idle, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, but you encourage the faint-hearted. You help the weak. You be patient with them all. There are critical times in our lives when we need encouragement. John Chrysostom, and uh, uh, one of the church fathers, 
had a line that I like a lot. He said, he that does not encourage one who is straightened by affliction makes him more hardened. So he's saying that if you don't help someone, you're kind of part of letting them be hardened, letting them be hurt. He says, exhort one another, encourage one another while it is called today. I mean, that implies there's going to be a day when it's not today. An- another day is coming. Encourage one another. We need one another. And we've talked about this a lot, I know. I, there's a story of, I've repeated this before, but there's a story of a minister who visited someone who had disconnected himself from the church. And uh, the guy said, I, you know, these Christians over there, I don't, you know, I don't like them. He gave lots of excuses for not coming, not being a part of the services, not being connected with the church. And the preacher just listened. This was back, he had this coal, coals in his fireplace. So the preacher just took a single coal out of the fireplace and placed it by itself. And while the other coals and embers stayed hot, that one single coal grew cold and died. And that itself is the parable. If, the, the African proverb is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We've got more than normal separating us now. We've got more than normal disconnecting us now. And it takes all of us. It takes all of us stretching toward one another to stay connected with one another. And it's difficult, but we can still be the church. Even in these circumstances, we can still be the church. I, I've heard stories this week of people who... Some of our shut-ins and elderly who can't get out or don't want, can't risk getting out to get groceries, there are members and family members who are taking them food. There's so much being done that I'm so grateful for so many good hearts who are exhorting one another. And I want to encourage you, examine your heart. What's in your heart? Watch yourself. And then when you turn to others and see them, be a comforting voice. Be a calming presence. There is so much heat right now. So much anxiety. We don't, you don't need to throw one more word in that's just fueling that anxiety. Be a calming voice. If you share something on social media, share an encouraging word. There's enough sarcasm. You know, there's enough snarkiness. There's enough just meanness out there. We don't need to be adding to it. We need to be exhorting and encouraging one another so that we are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The greatest problem, I'll say this without reservation, the greatest problem in our country right now, in our world right now, is not the pandemic, it is not uh, the COVID-19, it's not the mask or no mask, it's not politics, it's not the election. The greatest problem we have right now is the deceitfulness of sin. And it will always be the greatest problem in the world. We've got to guard our hearts from this distrust and disbelief of God are what will be our downfall. That's what's going to lead to my own personal downfall. I've got to keep my eyes on Jesus and keep my heart and trust in him. Satan operates through distrust. He deceives and says this, you don't need God's word. Has God said you will surely die? You will not surely die, Satan said. Well, Satan hardens our hearts because we we believe what he says It creates distrust in God. And like scar tissue that's more difficult to cut once it's healed, it's like our spiritual nerves are damaged and feeling decreases. And the heart is hardened by sin. Sin makes us hardened to receive grace. So exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So what we need is a reminder of truth. That's what an exhortation is. It's a reminder of truth. Worship itself is an exhortation of truth. We need to remind ourselves, encourage encourage one another. How do you encourage one another? I mean, there's lots of ways. Say something kind to someone. Write someone a card. Send someone a note of gratitude. Speak the truth of the gospel into their lives. Speak the truth that Jesus is reigning right now. That Jesus died for us. He rose for us. He's coming back for us. And we can have trust in that. So whatever whatever it is, it can be a short word. It can be a text message, a phone call, a card in the mail. But all those little things, do not underestimate the power of your words. A little bit of negative word thrown out there on social media, for example. There's a lot of heat out there. A little negative word can just fuel that fire much more than you think it will. Likewise, a a little positive word can heal someone and give them peace and comfort much more than you realize. 
All right, so watch, exhort, and third, share, verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, we share in Christ. He means we're partners in Christ. This isn't something really you do. This is just something we have to remember, that we are part of Jesus. And this is really the one that gets us because even, even if you're feeling unworthy, even if you feel that God is unable, we have to remember that Jesus counts us worthy. You share in him. Jesus is not going to let his body perish. He's not going to let just the unthinkable happen to us. I know it, I say that, but the unthinkable happens. We Sickness and death still still come. But the point is we are partners with Christ. Keep our eyes on him and he will not allow us to perish in the most unthinkable ways. The problem that Israel faced in the first century, the problem the first, cent, first century Christians faced, and the problem that we face really right now is not an issue of behavior, I don't think. It's primarily that we have a tendency to be deceived by sin and we're not watching for an evil, unbelieving heart. And it's going to harden us. And we forget that we are partners with Christ. We forget who is on our side. We forget that he fights for us. And as it says, the chapter ends, they didn't. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. We partake of the same things that Jesus partakes in. He reigns we will reign. We will share in that power and that glory. Why would we take our eyes off Jesus? There's so much, I know there's so much noise out there. There's so much distraction out there, but keep your eyes on Jesus. We need strength to persevere. And our assurance is not in the absence of conditions. Our assurance is not in what's going to happen. You know, what's going, what, what will the next few weeks and months bring? Our assurance is in the power of God's promise. Jesus is steadfast. Jesus is faithful. God is faithful. The question is, will we be? Watch yourself. Encourage one another and know that you share with Jesus. Your partners with him. Today, if you will hear his voice. Today. Okay, today. We're, we're thinking about tomorrow. We're thinking, what's going to come of this? What's, what will this bring to us? What's the next year going to look like? Stop thinking that. We have to consider it, I know. I shouldn't say just stop thinking it, but today. The, start with, here's what we do. Start with today. Today, if you hear his voice. Start with today, and tomorrow may end up taking care of itself. 